criminal justice employees tend to engage in activities which are intrusive in nature during the course of their eight-hour shift. This should come as little surprise given the fact that criminal justice practitioners often restrict the liberties and rights of individuals. Perhaps this is why criminal justice agencies and personnel are easy targets for litigation. Legal scholars such as Jeffrey Walker and Craig Hemmins argue that individuals who feel as though they have had their civil rights infringed upon are more likely to initiate civil suits rather than criminal charges against the law enforcement personnel in question. This is likely due to the fact that a civil action uh, is going to have a lower threshold, uh, that being the preponderance of the evidence. Also, if a civil case goes to a jury, the verdict does not necessarily need to be unanimous in order for a plaintiff to prevail. Section 1983 lawsuits are filed under federal law and seek damages from a justice employee, supervisor, and or department on the ground that the defendant acting under color of law violated the plaintiff's constitutional rights or rights given by federal law. And as we're going to see throughout the course, it's really not that hard for a plaintiff to file a Section 1983 lawsuit. This is because the rights given in the Bill of Rights and other constitutional amendments are elastic and they may accommodate many alleged rights. Um, also keep in mind that prisoners may file Section 1983 lawsuits against justice officials and they often do. Often Section 1983 suits are filed in federal court where discovery procedures tend to be a little bit more liberal than in state courts. If an individual files a Section 1983 lawsuit against a criminal justice employee, the employee may use what is referred to as the Qualified Immunity Defense. The Qualified Immunity Defense is used when a justice employee asserts that he or she is only liable if a clearly established statutory or constitutional right was violated of which a reasonable person would have known. Both of these elements must be proven by a preponderance of the evidence by the plaintiff, otherwise no liability ensues. Throughout the semester, we will be examining various cases where plaintiffs have filed Section 1983 cases against law enforcement personnel. In some cases, they prevail, and in some cases, they do not. It's important to note that municipalities can be held liable under Section 1983 for constitutional violations resulting from failure to train. However, whenever this happens, the failure to train must amount to a legal standard known as deliberate indifference. The standard of deliberate indifference is met if a plaintiff can demonstrate that a municipality knows of a need to supervise or train in a particular area and it deliberately chooses not to. Also, if a plaintiff typically needs to uh, suffer some sort of an injury as a result of a failure to train and there must be a casual connection between the duty to train and the injury in this week's discussion, I would like for everyone to read about a tragic drowning incident that occurred in the San Francisco Bay Area. Look at this case and decide whether or not, in your opinion, the survivor of the drowning uh, incident, or the, excuse me, the drowning victim's family, I should say, could they successfully sue the municipality under Section 1983 for failure to train? Of course, criminal justice employees get sued in state courts as well as federal courts. In fact, legal scholar Daryl Ross contends that plaintiffs tend to sue criminal justice personnel under state tort law quite a little bit. And as he illustrates in his book, Civil Liability and Criminal Justice, there are two types of state tort cases. The first type is an intentional tort, which occurs when there is a deliberate attempt on the part of the employee to bring some physical harm or mental coercion upon another person. 
There are a variety of different types of intentional torts and we will focus more on these next week. For now, let us turn our attention to negligence torts which arise whenever a criminal justice employee fails to act reasonably um, when he or she should have been able to foresee harm that was caused by the conduct in question. Think for a moment about a police chase. In your opinion, would it be appropriate for a police officer to drive 50 miles over the speed limit in order to catch an evading felon? What if the high-speed chase were to occur in a residential area or even a school zone? If an officer were to accidentally injure a pedestrian during the course of a chase, should he or she have been able to foresee the consequences of this act? As Daryl Ross asserts, gross negligence is typically required in order for a plaintiff to successfully prevail in a negligence tort case. Often this is determined by a judge or jury in a civil lawsuit. Let's look at another potential example of a negligence tort case involving gross negligence. Suppose a police officer is near the end of his or her shift. The officer notices a drunk driver and pulls the driver over. Rather than formally making an arrest, the officer orders the driver to call a friend in order to drive him home. Now suppose the officer leaves the scene and the driver decides to drive home on his own anyway. If the drunken driver were to injure an innocent bystander, could the officer be successfully sued for failing to make an arrest, which would have prevented an injury? Again, the answers to these questions are often deliberated between attorneys and may even vary from state to state according to state laws. In cases which uh, may be especially egregious, criminal justice employees may be subject to criminal liability under both state and federal law. As Daryl Ross asserts in the second chapter of his book, there are a variety of federal laws which may lead a criminal justice employee to a criminal justice employee's uh, possible incarceration if he or she is in fact found guilty. Keep in mind, though, that unlike in civil cases, the standard of evidence is much, much higher. We know that in criminal cases, a judge or jury must find that a defendant uh, was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. This indeed is a very high threshold, as it very well should be. In Chapter 2 of this book, Ross provides several cases of examples where law enforcement employees were imprisoned after being found guilty of a criminal charge. In his book, Ross also refers to the Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act of 1994. This federal law was more than likely the result of the infamous high-profile Rodney King case. Congress passed this law to redress patterns and practices of constitutional violations by the police. This law permits the Department of Justice to investi investigate claims of abuses by the police and also provides the DOJ with extremely broad investigative powers as well as prosecutorial authority in cases involving excessive uses of force. This same law also permits the DOJ to file civil actions on behalf of citizens. This is important because many times victims of official brutality are young, poor, and often members of racial minorities. And often they might be intimidated or not even aware that they have civil liberties under the law. And this law empowers the DOJ to curb official abuses. And as Ross points out, there are additional federal laws such as the Civil Rights of Institutionalized Persons Act, which is designed to protect the civil liberties of incarcerated persons. The Civil Rights of Institutionalized Persons Act does not only include situations where correctional officers use excessive force against inmates, this act also permits the DOJ to bring legal actions against correctional agencies that fail to provide adequate medical care for inmates. This is, in fact, an important issue in correctional law. 
And keep in mind that prison law is an important piece of the puzzle. In this course, we will actually spend two weeks looking at prison law. And as you will see, there are a variety of different legal issues associated with managing and maintaining correctional facilities. Besides being subject to both civil and criminal penalties, Professors Jeffrey Walker and Craig Hemmons argue that criminal justice employees who fail to comply with constitutional mandates might make evidence inadmissible in court. For example, let's suppose that a police officer conducts an unlawful search without a warrant. Even if he or she is unable to, or excuse me, is able, I should say, to link a piece of incriminating evidence to a the vicious criminal under the exclusionary rule, rule, this evidence simply cannot be used if it was obtained unlawfully. So in essence, because, an employee's unlaw because of an employee's unlawful behavior, an individual who is factually guilty will most likely be permitted to go. And this is a serious penalty that affects all of us, yet the court has been very clear on this. And we will, of course, discuss the exclusionary rule, rule later on during this course. Um, finally, it is worth mentioning that criminal justice employees who violate civil liberties uh, may be subject to administrative liabilities. Simply put, they lose their jobs or they could be subject to being disciplined. Nevertheless, as we will see later on in the course, criminal justice employees typically have a right to contest their discipline or termination and in some cases it is often difficult to fire a fully vested criminal justice employee depending upon things like civil service laws, uh, collective bargaining laws or policy manuals which give employees certain protections. In fact throughout the semester you may very well be surprised at cases where criminal justice employees were permitted to keep their jobs despite having engaged in unscrupulous or questionable behaviors. This is of course another topic altogether, but nevertheless it is one that we will be alluding to at least a little bit throughout this course.